Hey pals, I'm here today to do what I think is my first book haul of the year. So I haven't done any previous book hauls this year, I don't think, because I have been trying really hard to reduce my physical TBR and in doing that I've been trying to read books very quickly after the mentoring my home. So it's felt sort of pointless to show you a book when I'm going to read it in three weeks and also a lot of the books that have been coming into my home have been books that I've mentioned in anticipated releases videos and so that also feels pretty boring for you guys for me to talk about them and then two weeks later to haul them and then two weeks later to wrap them up so I haven't really been doing many hauls but in the last few weeks I've treated myself to a few more books that are books that I haven't featured in any other videos because it was my birthday so I just bought myself a few more books than I would do normally and so I thought I would talk about these books. The first five I'm going to speed through because they are in fact books I've spoken about in my anticipated releases videos which I'll link down below. You can go check them out if you haven't seen them already. I've been very good at my, making my way through those books and so I'm hoping to start doing monthly revisits where maybe starting in July I start reviewing, revisiting the books I was excited about in January and talk about whether I read them, whether I didn't, and if they met my expectations. Let me know if that sounds interesting. So I've already featured these books in those videos. The first one is by Ash Oak and Form by Melissa Harrison. This is a middle grade fantastical book about some little creatures who are trying to save the woodland from danger. The next one is a non-fiction memoir of sorts. That's 50 Sounds by Polly Burton. Jen kindly gave me this copy because she had a, a spare copy of it. It's beautifully published by Fitzcarraldo Editions. This is about the author learning to be a translator of the Japanese language. And so it's about her learning the language and all the interesting sort of social and cultural aspects to learning Japanese. It sounds fascinating. I've heard really great things. Then we have Kololo Hill by Nima Shah. This is set in Uganda in 1972, just after the decree comes out that all Asian Ugandans, Ugandans have to leave Uganda. And we're following one family in particular as they flee and like the repercussions of them having to just give up their home and all their possessions and how they have to adapt. And again, heard really great things. Then we have Empire of Wild by Sherry Demeline. I previously wanted to read her YA sort of dystopian called The Marrow Thieves, which I've heard amazing things about, um, but this is a um, book for adults. Um, Sherry Demeline is a member of the Georgian Bay Métis community in Ontario, and this is about a woman whose husband goes missing and a new Baptist preacher visits the town and she recognises him as her husband but when she confronts him he entirely denies it, says he's a different man, a different name and she sort of goes on a like adventure with a couple of other characters to uncover who he is and what's happened to her husband. Sounds fascinating, very mysterious. And then one that I'm part way through, just came out in April, is Sister Song by Lucy Holland. This is a um, fantasy book set in 535 AD in what we now call Cornwall but at the time was its own kingdom with its own king obviously and we're following um, these three siblings as they all adapt to what feels to be um, an incoming Saxon invasion and they all have sort of magical abilities and Merlin is a character in this story and this is based on a um, murder folk ballad which I don't know the story of so like I am not spoiled for this but if you do know that folk ballad you may know the way this story is going to go obviously it's a very beautiful cover there's that and now we have the other 11 which I haven't previously spoken about so I was very kindly contacted by um, Taproot Press they're a new publisher and um, they contacted me because I've previously spoken about Linda Cracknell's novel called Call of the Undertow, which I really loved. That one came out in 2013. I thought it was wonderful. And they have published her newest book, which is The Other Side of Stone. I love this cover. The design is by Ignacio Paul. And this is a naked hardback, which is glorious. It's quite a short book, only just over 100 pages. And this sounds like the sort of book that I will truly love. So I'm definitely going to read this in the next few weeks. This is the history of a Perthshire woollen mill told through the lives of those locked in and out of its walls, their stories tied together by the impact of industrialisation on rural Scotland and the struggle for women's rights. We follow characters who um, 
are living in and around the woolen mill in um, 1831, 1913 and 1990 and I just think it's going to be a really interesting history of this location as told through the different lives around this woolen mill. Very intrigued by this one. The next one is China Room by Sanjeev Sahota. He previously wrote The Year of the Runaways, which I think was long listed for the booker. And I heard loads of people speak about that one, and I never got around to reading it. Um, this one sounds really intriguing. I, as with the previous book, love books that are set in different time periods with a different character in each. I think if those stories are intertwined, it can be a really interesting commentary on how people in our past that we've never met have such an impact on our present. So this is set in 1929 in Punjab. We follow a young woman who was married with her sisters to a group of brothers, but it was a marriage where they were kept separate. So they don't know which ones they've married um, and the women are segregated from the men. And it's about her trying to discover which of the brothers she's married to. And then in um, present day, I think, England, yeah, in 1999, we follow a young man who is um, running from his experiences of addiction, racism and estrangement from the culture of his birth and he goes back to the farm in Punjab where those women were from and sort of tries to revisit his family history. So I think that sounds really intriguing. And I have a couple of first books in YA, no, middle grade fantasy series. I am trying to get much more into middle grade fantasy. I love reading it as a child and I've been really enjoying the Nevermore series and I just want more books like that. Um, so one that is coming out in September and I was very kindly um, contacted about, and it sounds glorious, and I immediately was like, yes, I would love a copy, is um, Fireborn. So I think the series is called Fireborn and the first book is called 12 and the Frozen Forest and it's by Ashling Fowler. This sounds so magical. Um, it says it is set in the snowy northern forests of an imagined prehistoric world and we follow a young girl who takes an oath to be a huntling which means that she will protect the seven clans and in doing that she will defeat monsters. So I think there's going to be lots of magical creatures which is something I love and like the idea of like people training, um, like a group of people coming together at once with them training to be huntlings. I love all those things and this one sounds like it could be a new, really popular and successful middle grade fantasy series. And this next one I think has been out for a few years and I've heard really great things about it and so I decided to pick it up and start the series. And that is A Carter Witch by Nnedi Okorafor. This is set in Nigeria and we follow a young girl called Sunny who was born in New York but has since um, moved with her family to Nigeria. It says her features are West African but she's albino and she's asked to um, join a school for people with magical powers but I think she joins a bit late because her magical powers took a while to like show themselves and her and her friends um, whilst they're training are asked to um, track down a career criminal who knows magic. It says will their training be enough to help them against a threat whose powers greatly outnumber theirs. So you know with um, middle grade fantasy there is often this element of like following a protagonist who has to join some form of school or society because they have magical powers, meet a group of friends, go free training and then defeat some like magical force um, and I'm fine <laughs> with that being the trope as long as like everything else around it is really unique and interesting and I think um, both of these sound like they have really unique and interesting worlds so can't wait to get to them. And then one I recently picked up only arrived like a week ago and I finished a book the day it arrived and I thought you know I'm going to treat myself by reading a book that's just come through the post which is something I rarely do because I have like too many books but as my TBR decreases I feel less guilty about doing it. Um, so that book is Silence is a Sense by Leila al Amar, and this came out earlier this year. Um, this is about a woman who is living in an unnamed city in England. She's living in a block of flats and she is a Syrian refugee and because of PTSD she is mute and so she's watching these people. She's not building connections with them initially, she's just watching them and they're all aware she's watching so there's this sort of um, level of awkwardness to the situation and she starts to witness things that she shouldn't witness um, and that are violent and like, criminal activities and this is a blend of like commentary on what it's like for her as a Syrian refugee, what people expect 
um, what they expect her to represent as a Syrian refugee and also a mem like her memories as she is um, fleeing Syria and her travels across Europe trying to get to a place of safety. So yeah, I'll talk about this more when I wrap it up but I very much enjoyed it. And because of reading that, um, I will say the author is not Syrian, she's from Kuwait. So I read this and really enjoyed it but kept thinking, you know, again, like I want to know much more and I remember a couple of years ago Jen talking about this book and lots of people picking it up um, and saying it was excellent and I have a TBR like a wish list um, I have two separate non-fiction ones one is for memoirs and personal essays it's probably about 100 books long and then another one is for like um, sort of pure like non-fiction books um, that aren't like personal stories they're more like um, histories or social commentaries stuff like that um, and there's too many for me to get to them all and I want to learn everything there is to learn in the world and so it's I, I just constantly live every day feeling like I have the smallest bit of knowledge compared to the amount I would like to have um, and one of those um, sort of geopolitical histories which I don't have is um, truly understanding the situation in Syria and I heard this book was really amazing and that's Dispatches from Syria The Morning They Came For Us by Janine Di Giovanni and I believe the author was a journalist who um, worked in the Middle East for two decades um, and travelled in Syria um, between 2012 and 2016 she follows both sides of the story and it says this is an unflinching account of a nation on the brink of disintegration and an unforgettable testament to human resilience in the face, face of unimaginable horrors I'm going to read this one um, and then I would like to try and pick up um, fiction and non-fiction by Syrian people. So if you've read any non-fiction or fiction um, by Syrian authors do let me know but I'm going to start with this one which as I said is by a journalist who travelled to Syria um, rather than somebody who lived in Syria at the time just because I, well, I want like more context um, and then I'm going to carry on reading more. So there's that one. And then a book I picked up for Aussie April because I realised um, most of the books I had lined up for Aussie April were novels um, and I wanted to read more non-fiction and sadly I didn't get to this one on Aussie April but um, I'm obviously going to read this one very soon, it sounds amazing. And that is The Beautiful Fire Country, How Indigenous Fire Management Could Help Save Australia by Victor Stephenson. So Victor Stephenson um, is an Indigenous land management expert um, and he focuses on how the revival of cultural burning practices and improved reading of country could help to restore our land. He was trained by two elders who gave him lots of cultural and ecological knowledge for fire management in Australia. And this book is like the blend of two things I find fascinating. So I studied wildlife conservation at uni, so I obviously find conservation um, and anything to do with the environment um, and trying to um, save the environment or protect it fascinating but more and more I've become very interested in how that can be done without the intervention of what is effectively like white colonists um, when I was at university it was something we uh, spoke about a lot especially when focusing on um, ecotourism and protected area management um, in both those situations um, a lot of those examples of like good practice have been um, dictated by um, white people who like who, whose people historically colonized that land did horrific things there in order to make profit and I truly really believe that the the most we can do to try and um, make as big an impact on habitat protection as possible is to allow the people who did it for thousands of years successfully to do it um, and to listen to them at a, a policy maker level um, and so I think books like this are super important and I'm hoping to learn a lot. And then another book that was on my non-fiction TBR, I think I added this one last year and still haven't managed to read it. Again, like I do read um, more non-fiction now than I used to but I still don't read as much like like pure non-fiction as I'd like. I tend to lean more towards memoirs which I absolutely love so I don't want to read less of them um, but perhaps I need to read less novels in order to make more space for non-fiction because there's just so much to learn in the world and I know so little and need to know so much more and one of those books which I had on the list and um, was infuriated at myself that I hadn't already read 
is The Hundred Years' War on Palestine, A History of Settler Colonial Conquest and Resistance by Rashid Khalidi. And I have been reading lots of articles lately, obviously. Articles titled things like, you know, um, everything you need to know about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I read those articles and I'm like, this is not everything I need to know. I still don't understand much of what you've just said um, because you referred to, to people um, and organisations that you've given no context for. And so I understand the most basic level, but that's not enough. So I have bought this book um, and obviously I'm going to read this one very, very soon. Um, I'm hoping to just finish the non-fiction book I'm currently reading and then pick this one up. Um, I will say um, this edition is only just over 300 pages, but the font is very, very small. Um, so yeah, like if you can find a different edition, perhaps go for that um, if you struggle with small font because I would always just rather there's more pages and like more easy to read font, but I'm still very much looking forward to this one and hoping that this will give me like the base knowledge and then I can um, you know find more books to read and yeah do feel free to give me ro more recommendations if you've perhaps read this book and then yourself have then read other books um, about this history I'd be really grateful for your recommendations and then I have three more books and these are the most recent ones I've treated myself to the first one being a poetry collection which happens very very rarely Last year I read Homey by Denise Smith, it was one of my favourite books of the year, and I watched an author event on YouTube, which I'll link down below, where um, Denise read their poetry and answered lots of questions, and also one of their, I believe, very dear friends um, read their poetry and asked, answered loads of questions. And that other poet was um, Brittany Black Rose Capri, and her collection is called Black Queer Ho, and I absolutely loved her poems. I immediately went and added it to my list of poem poetry I wanted to pick up um, and haven't picked it up in about a year and I um, was just going through those lists the other day and just thought you know why haven't you picked this one up like you're sure to adore it because every poem she read I loved like I said I'll link it down below go and check it out because both of them were just fantastic um, and I really loved hearing both of them read their poetry out her poems are pretty explicit so if that's not something you're into maybe not um I very much enjoy that I found myself either like really laughing at her poems I think she is incredibly funny um I also found lots of her poems incredibly powerful in how like filled with rage they were and like bitter irony and I just thought they were um really intelligent um but also funny and sensual and impactful poems. I just really love them. So I'm very excited to be able to read the collection in full. And then this next one is perhaps the most beautiful book I'm going to show you. So I saw Sean from Storytime hauled this one and was immediately like, that looks amazing. I really wanted to own it. And then I saw Sean review it very soon after and say how much she loved it. So I obviously had to buy it. And that is Sasha Masha by Agnes Borinsky. This is a contemporary YA novel. I don't read many contemporary YA novels, um, but some I really do adore and I'm hoping this will be one of them. I mean, look at that cover. Let's see if we can find out who did that cover. The jacket illustration is by Carolina Rodriguez Fuyun Mayer. I hope I said that correctly. So this book is about it says 17 year old Alex just wants to be a real boy to feel like he belongs in his home and his family in his skin. He starts dating someone called Tracy. It says still Alex feels strange as he accepts the role of boyfriend. In his daydreams he imagines a different version of himself swiping on lipstick and slipping into sunset orange dresses. When he meets the beautiful and confident Andre all sorts of windows open and Alex's heart slowly Alex begins to realise maybe his name isn't Alex at all maybe it's Sasha Masha. It says transgender author Agnes Borinsky deftly explores gender identity and queer romance in this evocative and profound debut novel. And even like the inside jacket design is just beautiful. So yeah, sounds wonderful, looks beautiful, I hope, I love it. And this last one is also beautiful and it was published last year by Feminist Press. I think it sounds like the sort of book I could truly love. And it is A World Between by Emily Hashimoto. Look at that brilliant cover. So 
In 2004, we follow two college students, Eleanor Suzuki and Lena Shah. They meet in an elevator and on the brink of adulthood, they fall into a whirlwind romance. And then years later, they run into each other on the streets of San Francisco and the two find themselves irreversibly pulled back together. So as we follow their friendship and their fraught history, unfolding into a new kind of love story for millennial immigrant America. I think this sounds like the sort of book I could absolutely love. I haven't heard anyone review it, um, but the reviews I have seen on Goodreads are really positive. Um, I looked into the publisher and they have loads of other books that sound really amazing. And also, the author looks super cool. So why wouldn't I want to read this book? So yeah, hoping to really enjoy this one. And this one's fairly long, it's like 400 pages, lovely big font, which I'm very happy about. So I'll be reviewing this one very soon as well. So those are all the books. If you haven't heard me speak about all of these by the end of August, I mean, are you really going to keep tabs on me? <laughs> but if you do, then feel free to tell me off if by the end of August I haven't read all of these. I'd like to read them all before then, but I also have 20 books out from the library and 27 books on my reservation list from the library. So you know, I've got a problem. Um, thank you so, so much for watching. Let me know if you've read any of these books or if you think you're going to pick some of these books up now because you like the sound of them. And also let me know what books you have hauled recently and what book you're most excited to read in the next couple of weeks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!